Okay, <clears throat> good morning everyone. Um, I just want to, to give you this short summary of uh, the course in transport localization and economic development. Unfortunately, I was ill last uh, Thursday, but uh, we'll try to give you some, some main points uh, uh, from the course and uh, subsequently I will also show you some uh, solutions to the two group works that we have been through. Just comment briefly upon uh, parts of the solutions. <coughs> <coughs> um, the learning objectives in this course has been to give you an understanding of how economic forces determine the location of economic activities. Uh, be it businesses, trade, cities, and so forth. Um, we have tried also to, to, uh, to show you the importance of transport infrastructure uh, when it comes to uh, being a premise for regional development, economic development, and also urban development. Uh, the course is theoretic. But I will, uh, I will give you the, the advice to try to, to take out the main contents of the theories, try to understand the logic of the theories. Um, once you have understood that, it will be easier for you on the exam to use the literature that you have at hand to, to solve the exam questions. So I introduced you to the main economic theories converting the localization of economic activity. Come back to them. And the second part <coughs> presents theories and model that focuses more on transport infrastructure, but also on economic growth as such. Not then only on localization, but also economic growth as such. Uh, and some theoretical studies have been uh, been uh, been uh, referred to during during some of these uh, these uh, lectures. So, as you know, the exam is on the nineteenth of May. Counts sixty percent of the final grade. Um, the mandatory course paper counts forty percent. So it's. Uh, it's kind of important to, to, to do as best as you can, of course, on both of them. Um, the mandatory course paper counts actually quite a bit uh, here. You may read the answers in, uh, sorry, you may write the answers in, in uh, Norwegian or English. Or a mixture, if you like. That's not a problem. Uh, but it's uh, so. So you are free to choose between the two languages. Open book exam, all printed and written material, and the calculator with empty memory is allowed. So you can have uh, all printed and written, including dictionaries, the literature, the lecture notes, any other additional literature that you may want to bring with you, and so on. But as I said, it's very, very important that you have tried to understand the logic of the theories. Don't try to start reading this, all this material at the exam. So you need to prepare well. Um, so, uh, uh, it's also important to use the literature, you can refer, you can use it, you can use it also without referring to it. Uh, but the graders are quite familiar with this literature, so it's easy to see where you have taken it from. And please note that your own interpretation, your own analysis, and your own views is welcomed. So don't only think that you should refer word by word to the literature, but any 
thing that you add from your own mind is, uh, is, uh, is valuable. But you should try to have support for your viewpoints in the literature. So, so that will be good. Um, the literature is in the, the article collection, the two, the two volumes. They are quite, quite comprehensive. Uh, they should be considered as a kind of a library to, to, to this course. It's, uh, it's the, let's say, the basic literature uh, on the field. There are no textbooks that are actually covering a course like this. That's why we have this article collection. Uh, to read and remember word by word is not what you should do. You should read, focus on the main parts, the main understanding, and then you use it as a support at the exam. That's how you do it. Handouts and lecture notes comes in addition to the, to the article collection. So this was a kind of the introduction. <coughs> and I showed you at the introduction some maps, some pictures, of cities, regions. I showed you a picture of New York, or a couple of pictures of New York. I showed you a picture of the Oslofjord area. I showed you a picture of, of Europe, and the growth center in Europe, the blue banana. And, uh, and we had a discussion around that. And the introductory lecture, and so some of the problems that I tried to discuss there has, has then been the underlying, <coughs> so to speak, reason for why we are interested in these theories. That is to try to understand the development of regions and cities. Because it's not easy, <coughs> as you may have understood, to, to get a very, let's say, the, a very strict and unique and, and ambiguous explanation of what is happening in various regions or cities. There are many models that can be used. And they are, in very many cases, complementary in the sense that they are supporting each other. Ah, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> so, in the second lecture, we I turn to uh, how to how we can measure, let's say, the the primary effects of transport infrastructure improvements, meaning uh, how we measure the socio-economic benefits, and that is. Uh, a kind of, let's say, it's, it's, it may seem quite simple, but actually these two types of analysis are in them. A lot of the other theories that we are dealing with later on in the course are embedded in these types of analysis. Because if you have, let's say, a, uh, a transport project which can be expected to cause economic growth. That will affect, for instance, for instance, the traffic forecasts in the project. Because if you have economic growth, it's, uh, there are reasons to believe that the, the traffic growth will be stronger, and hence the, the benefits of these projects will be larger. So to understand <coughs> for a given region or for a given project within a region, a region that here we might, for instance, get a linkage of two, two uh, regions together. That may cause some mechanisms to take place which may give a growth in traffic, which is again then an indicator of, of socioeconomic benefits. But underneath this analysis of traffic growth is the theories of, let's say, circular and cumulative causation, 
new economic geography and so on, which, which then predicts a change in the activity level if you change, uh, let's say, parts of the transport infrastructure to achieve, let's say, for instance, a bottleneck relief between two regions. So these two schools of <coughs> thought are, uh, are was was discussed in this uh, in this uh, lecture, the micro-oriented cost-benefit analysis, where you have one chapter from from a book which can help you in understanding what cost-benefit analysis is about, trying to measure on an in for for each let's say individual each user of the transport system, we measure the benefits, add them together for all the users, discount them for all the years in which this project can, or this improvement will have effect. Normally we use 40 years as the, the time horizon of the analysis, and then we held it against the investment and operating costs. And then also we may take into consideration inter external effects like emissions to air and so on. But we work with the users. We map the traffic flow and how the costs of travel for the, for the users are affected. In this case, <coughs> we are dealing with output from a region or a country. We try to estimate the causal relationship between transport infrastructure capital investments and output. Uh, I showed you a, a, a graph where I said that the output from a cost-benefit analysis for one project. Then you can take the output for a, from a cost-benefit analysis from, let's say, all the projects in a region or a country within a given period of time. And you can add the benefits together and the costs. And, you, and, and there has been, a, let's say, a, an expectation that that if you add all the benefits and costs together for all the projects within a given period of time, you should get approximately the same answer as you get from here, from this type of analysis, which is done on an aggregated level. And I tried to show you that that assumption is not necessarily true, because a cost-benefit analysis may reveal benefits let's say, increased leisure time, which is not a part of what you can measure as output in a macro production function. <coughs> I will not go into detail <coughs> if questions are made at the exam about this, but I, I just want you to, to reflect upon the, log the different logic in these two, among these two theories. Lecture three <coughs> dealt with uh, classical economic growth models and input-output models. Uh, <coughs> we <coughs> I introduced cumulative causation here for the first time. We came back to that when we, uh, when we dealt with uh, the calder dixon terwell model, the four-step model, which I will discuss a bit more later on. And uh, <coughs> that model was developed in the 1970s, and it was based on the work by Gunnar Myrdal, which I will come back to a bit later on. But <coughs> the, the focus in this type of reasoning is that we have economies of scale in production. <coughs> meaning that as long as you have excess product, uh, production capacity, 
increasing output will reduce the average costs. And when you reduce the average cost in production, you may gain a competitive power, both if you are a producer of final goods to the end customer in the supply chain, or if you are a supplier to the next level downstream in the supply chain. If the, if the average costs go down and you have a, a fair amount of competition, costs for the whole network of economic players will go down. And that may attract both people and capital into the region. And hence you may have a, a growth in size, growth in activity, which may take this scale effect a bit further, because then you increase the size of the demand and uh, so forth. Increased diversity <coughs> may also affect productivity, because increased diversity means, in most cases, increased competition and perhaps also better products, which is also an underlying assumption here. The input-output model <coughs> was also used in Group Work 1 to illustrate how a change in demand or supply of goods and services can affect the demand throughout the economy. And we had a very simple transaction table between sectors in, uh, in, the ex in an exercise on Group Work 1. And this is often used to assess, let's say, how a big porch or a big road project or a big railway project or a big airport project can affect a given region during the construction phase. <coughs> because in many cases, this can be of great interest for two reasons. One is that there may be a certain level of unemployment in the region and often transport infrastructure investments has been used to stimulate employment and growth. The second reason for why we can, could be interested in input-output studies is that the level of employment and economic activity in a region may be quite high in the first place. So what could then happen if you add even more activity into a region like this? Then you may get a pressure on prices, which let's say is a break of this assumption that we have fixed prices in, the, in, the, in, this, uh, in this analysis. But you can use it anyway to say something about the increase in economic activity, production level and uh, employment level. And then we can use other types of model to say something about whether this increased activity level will be a problem for the region if the capacity is already fully utilized. But what you should be able to do here is to use the literature to do a simple input-output study based on numerical information. As shown in group work one. Then we had a second in the lecture four, <coughs> classical economic growth models. Uh, second part, and then we went on with this, <coughs> sorry, this four-step calder dixon turtle model, which is a practical use of a circular cumulative causation thinking, where export is the driver, export without uh, to the world or to a different region or whatever, the export from a region or from a country 
is the driving force because the assumption is then that when you increase exports, you increase the activity level in the region to produce and to supply the production of the goods that are exported. So then the activity level increases. And <coughs> the multi we had a kind of a Fedorn coefficient, which was a kind of a multiplier on productivity, where we said that this coefficient takes up several factors that, for instance, have to do with increasing product diversity, improved technology, research and development activities, and so on. And then this Fedorn was, uh, coefficient was developed in 1949. So it's actually also preceding Myrdal's work from 1957. And the, the understanding back in 1949 was that this was a kind of a kind of a black box. Empirically, Ferdorn showed that increased size of the economic system in a region had productivity, positive productivity effects. But the nature of these effects was not yet known. So those effects became revealed by Myrdal, but not, not entirely. And then again by Romer in, during his work with uh, endogenous growth theory. And further on by Krugman and Venables in this new economic geography. And there were also contributions by Michael Porter from 1990 on his industrial cluster theory, which says something about the mechanisms that supports this coefficient and supports this expectation or hypothesis that size of an economic system, the diversity, will contribute positively to productivity growth. So it's, it's also, in, in addition to be able to use this four-step model in, a, in an exercise, it's also good to be able to reflect upon the link between this early work by Ferdorn and what happened afterwards with Myrdal, Romer and Krugman Porter. Because they, the, the subsequent theories and the theoretical work is, is actually referring back to, among other things, this Ferdorn coefficient. So this is the, the, the four-step model where, where we have uh, productivity as the underlying productivity in the region. We have this Ferdorn coefficient and we have, have the, uh, we have the uh, activity level in the, in the previous period. We have the price change as a change in, uh, let's say, uh, wages minus the productivity level. So if productivity growth is stronger than the wage growth, <coughs> we have a negative price change, which is good from a competition point of view. And this negative price change, if you remember back to what I have said about economies of scale and increased demand, and reduce costs. This is one way of considering it when you have productivity growth, wage growth, and if that results in a negative price, you sort of add competitive power to the system. And then we had <coughs> the, the uh, increase in, uh, in exports or change in exports as a function of Price of the exporting good, this one. Price of competing goods in the market, in the world market, the market which you export your goods to. And then <coughs> the 
economic state of affairs in the export markets. If you, have, if you are exporting to, uh, to let's say, uh, Germany, and Germany is in, a very, uh, is in a good state of growth, this will contribute positively to the, to the demand for exports. And this minus says something about the, uh, this B0 is the elasticity, the price elasticity. And B0 is then measured in absolute numbers. So normally we have a price elasticity with a negative sign, set, let's say minus 0 0.6. And then you should use <coughs> 0 0.6 not minus 0 0.6, but just 0 0.6 as B0. And then you have the minus in front. So then you have minus 0 0.6 times the price change in percent from here. The price elasticity with respect to the price change in the, of competing goods in the in the world market is positive, meaning that when the price goes up on the competing good, that will have a positive impact on the change, because we measure this in percentage changes of exports. And the same with income. When income increases, we have a positive elasticity, which contributes to the growth here. We'll come back to that when we deal with the, with the group work more. And then finally, <coughs> we uh, use this x because we see here that q is used in, in equation 2, p is used in equation 3, and x is used in equation 4. And c0 is a multiplier meaning that if you have one unit of increase in exports, that will cause, let's say, a 1.7 or 1.4 increase in the output in the economy, which is measured by Y. And this means simply that you need goods, services to produce a unit of the exporting good, and that is captured by this C0 as a multiplier. You have calculated that in the in group work one. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> then we move on to transport policy and uh, uh, planning in an economic development perspective where we, I just showed you some uh, concerns with respect to planning of transport infrastructure. Just showed you what type of, of considerations that we need to have in place when we, when we do planning of transport systems. Economic factors affecting development, which is, let's say, the main issue at stake in this course. Population, composition and growth. The interplay between land use and transport system, which we come back to in, in lecture 8 on the, on the urban systems. Transport facilities, the, the existence of public transport, for instance. Travel patterns for the, for the citizens. Terminal and transport facilities for people and freight. Traffic control features, which also affects, let's say, the supply of services within the transport network. Because if you cannot, let's say, have free parking at work, then that will affect the travel pattern. It will affect the choice of mode, because then at particularly in urban areas with, a, let's say, if you have a dense public transport network, no free parking will, will make more people use public transit instead of car. 
financial resources, <coughs> of course, you need to have money in place to invest. C can be from the public budget, but also from a um, uh, public-private partnership, or even only private money in some countries. Uh, you also need to have resources in the, uh, at hand to, to operate a public transit, public transport system. Social community value factors may be very important, uh, particularly when we talk about urban development, should the city be very car-based or should it be denser and based on public transit? Should we have a very strong focus on, let's say, the living conditions for people and the connection to the transport system? Uh, because if you see some, uh, particularly some American cities or even other in other parts of the world, you have very big and rather visually dominating road systems, which is a different story from what you find in some of the older European cities, where you have a denser network, more public transport, more walking and cycling, which affects the way people live actually. So point nine is also important to have in mind. <coughs> Economic <coughs> development impacts of transport. You had one exercise on this in group work two. And uh, it's, it's good to, to have a checklist like this. There may be other factors that can be included as well. Uh, but we see here that there are some factors that can be uh, assessed, they can be described. Methods for evaluating them can be, uh, can be used. And uh, development strategies that can be a result of, uh, let's say, preferences will, will be in this, uh, in this right-hand column. For instance, if we consider a toll road project or a toll ring project around, let's say, Molde here or uh, any city, where you impose a ring of toll, uh, toll stations to collect money from the, from the users, for instance, to be able to fund the project, uh, <coughs> we might uh, have some objectives connected to that. One may be that we should fund a project, but if that type of funding will cause the consumer expenditures to increase, that may be, this may be the uh, the result that we may actually want to have a policy that reduce uh, future fuel and vehicle expenditures. In the case of a toll ring, you may reduce future fuel and vehicle expenditures, but you do that <coughs> because people may not want to use this transport system as extensively as before because the, the, the tolls are too high. And then we have to see this in connection with let's say, retail and tourism and impact on specific industries. Because, for instance, local retail in the city center may suffer if people would like to go elsewhere to, to do their shopping because of the high road tolls. So <coughs> we may want to reduce fuel consumption and, uh, and uh, expenditures, but at the same time, we may want to increase or improve the conditions for the city center. 
to, to strengthen the, the local retail. So we need, we need to balance things here. So that is why such a table is, is useful, that it can contribute to an illustration of conflicting factors. On the one hand, we have to fund improved infrastructure. On the other hand, we want to strengthen the central business district. Could be contradictory. Transport project cost efficiency with a benefit cost model. If, let's say, the traffic is priced away from using this system because of high consumer expenditures, high tolls, the benefit cost analysis may not be in favor of the project. So there are a lot of things that can be derived from a table if you take it line by line and say where are the conflicts here where are we where do we have to 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 put our our focus because it doesn't help you much to have a very strong focus on basic access retail and tourism and so on if the whole thing is let's say hindered by some actions connected to the nature of the project, like high, too high road tolls, just as an example. Then <coughs> we moved on to location. And we had Weber's location model and Hotelings location theory. Uh, Weber's location model is, is, uh, is, is quite simple. It's based on balancing transport costs uh, between suppliers, manufacturer, and the end user market. But even this simple model can be used to, to illustrate some, uh, some nice, uh, nice examples, which I've tried to <laughs> challenge a bit on that uh, through this uh, group work number two. And the same with Hotelings location theory, <coughs> which is also quite illustrative uh, in uh, assessing what might take place if you, if you, uh, if you uh, have a certain urban structure, for instance, and a certain structure on, uh, on the, let's say, the industries in that urban area whether there are industries that are producing identical products or whether there are industries that produces variants of the same product but not the similar product. So <coughs> Weber's theory rests on two basic assumptions <coughs> with uh, profit maximization and uh, we study <coughs> the firm located in one specific or one single point in the geographic space. This can be extended to, let's say, multi-plant multi firms. It's not a very big problem, but for, for the sake of clarity, we can limit it to, to one single point in the ge geographic space. So we study how the enterprise will localize to maximize profits, which means in this case, we take the demand and the prices as given, and we minimize the, 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 the transport costs here. <coughs> and you saw that there might be different answers connected to the technical efficiency of the, of the production plant for each of uh, for, for each of the companies uh, maybe connected to the composition of supplies from different supplying sources uh, it may also the location may also be dependent upon whether let's say expenditures connected to rent of uh, of um, 
production facilities, buildings and so on, could also affect location in this case. I'm then referring to the Isodapan analysis. This is the, perhaps the most complex uh, illustration. Here we have supplying firms, for MN1, M2, the market for uh, finished goods here, and this is the location, which is then as a result of the optimum location, given the distance from the suppliers and the nature of the goods that are uh, transported from the suppliers, the let's say the technical efficiency level of the of the producer and uh, and the costs of getting the goods to the to the final consumers customers and then <coughs> this is a kind of an illustration of a dynamic structure where this company is tempted to move let's say to this point where you get a different, perhaps a different structure when, with respect to the suppliers, which may be beneficial for the firm. And then you may have a second location here, where you keep the supplier M2, shift to M4, and then you address a different market M5, which may give you even higher profits. And uh, <coughs> it's uh, important to to say that companies doesn't move very often. So this is often, this is the practical application of this is that a company will check all the possibilities. They will analyze the, re, the location of, the, of their markets, of their suppliers and the conditions for, for production. Because if, uh, if a company is going to consider to move from here and to somewhere along these, this, uh, this curve, they need to have a $10 reduction in production costs. Because that will make them, make them indifferent between having $10 in extra transport costs as compared to $10 in reduced production costs. And uh, that, that reduction may take place, for instance, because a, a local commun community may say that, well, if you move here, we can offer you <coughs> cheap housing, cheaper housing. And if you look around a bit, in, uh, in perhaps in your own country, we'll see that Communes located, let's say, in the outskirts of, uh, of urban areas, they try to, to attract businesses by offering them cheaper housing. So this, these are concentric circles in this illustration, but they may be, have, a, have different shapes depending on the shape of the transport system. Let's say this concentric illustration assumes that there is a very tight transport network, very tight, almost indefinitely tight. But if you have a few, just a few arterial roads, for instance, leading from the center, these circles will, will have a shape which goes something like this, which I showed you on the, during that, that specific lecture on the, on the blackboard. <coughs> then hoteling. <coughs> um, start with very simple, uh, with a very simple illustration where you have price costs along the vertical axis and you have the, the market along the horizontal axis. The production costs per unit is, is uh, the height of this uh, vertical line. You see that the production cost in, for company B is higher than from company A. The slope of the lines says something about transport cost per mile or per kilometer. And we see that the transport cost per 
distance unit is higher for A than for B. And we see that we have the same costs here in this point. And to the right of this point, B will have market, have the market because they have the lower costs. If you compare with this line, and uh, the contrary situation on the left-hand side, where A has the lowest costs. And then we can start play around with uh, how this these costs can vary. And this could be a it's a very simple illustration, but it could provide a very good, simple framework for strategic considerations from a, from a company. Because, let's say if you are in this situation, <coughs> where B then has a very, it has a limited share of the market. So, in this case, B has the market within a very limited range. And they have that, even if their production costs are much higher. They can live with that because the distance from A is so, so large. Even if A has both lower transport costs and lower production costs. Distance matters. So if you are <coughs> employed in a bank and you are going to, you get an application for funding from this company B. And you're going to, uh, to say something about, well, do you believe that the, this company will survive in the long run? And if you are able to get information about transport costs and production costs per unit, it shouldn't be perhaps that difficult, and compare it with the competitors, which may perhaps be a bit more difficult, but still manageable, <coughs> then you can, uh, you can ask the manager of B for a meeting and say to him that, well, or her, that, well, we see that you are in a quite vulnerable situation here. Because if A is able to reduce production costs just a little, or the transport costs even more than they already have, you will be out of business. Because then, if you reduce transport costs, a will get the whole market. If you reduce production costs, let's say down to this level, A will also be out of the maybe B will also be out of the market. Sorry, B will be out of the market. So then you can start to discuss, well, what will it do if you if I give you <coughs> if I give you the loan to improve something here, how will that affect this illustration? And then the manager will say that, well, I think Perhaps I will get, <coughs> get the most out of reducing my production costs. And well, if, if, if B manages to uh, reduce the production costs down to this level, keep the transport costs, you will see that the market share will increase quite a lot. So that is one strategy which may be viable, <coughs> particularly if there is no reason to expect A's transport cost to be to become further reduced. Just as a simple, simple example of how this can be applied in practice. Here we have <coughs> hoteling model for spatial competition. <coughs> a uniform settlement of people, customers, from zero to L. Two companies located in A and B at the outset. <coughs> and then we discussed what will happen here if these companies are able to move without large relocation, relocation costs. And again, please remember that companies don't move very often. So these are decisions that are made before they perhaps make the first move. But they will tend <coughs> to locate close to each other in the center of the market if they are in a type of competition which is a non-price competition. 
Then they compete on quality. They compete on variants of the same product. Car dealers is an example where the, the suppliers of cars have a certain market power because there are different car brands. And once a deal with a customer is closed so that the customer has bought a car, then they are sort of locked in with this supplier, this one supplier, because of aftermarket services and items that you need to have your car running, so to speak. So these companies located in the middle here, they share a common pool of customers. And they can do that because they offer distinct variants of the same products. But you will not see the same clustering in the middle if there are suppliers of identical products. So you don't very often see petrol stations located very close to each other. You see it actually a bit of that in this, in this city, surprisingly uh, enough, I would say. But you may find two petrol stations located quite closely to each other, but they are not very often on the same side of the road. And hence they have a market split because of different directions. It may not be too easy to change directions for when you drive, and hence you have a split between, let's say, northbound and southbound directions on the highway. But <coughs> if you are located close to your competitor and you engage in non-price competition, that is, that is fine. But if this competition starts to get, or, the, the, or if somebody locates closely together with very homogeneous products, you may have a situation with a kind of price competition. And then you will have a development where prices drop until perhaps one of the competitors go broke or, or pull out of the competition. which was discussed in the, in the group work too. So this is the conclusions, <coughs> more or less referring to what I have said already. So then I'll just take a short, uh, short break. We'll, uh, I'll just uh, stop and start again.